Welcome to episode 20 of The Crescendo with me and Ira Russo. If you like what you see, hit that subscribe button and tell a friend. All right, this is my talk with comedian Ken Gar. You've been missed. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah just doing our thing, bro. Uh, I'm just doing some uh, some changes around the house. We've got a new couch. Very and, cool. Uh, putting up some shelves, you know, doing my husband stuff, you know what I mean? Right on, yeah. Congratulations again. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, we're newlyweds. Yeah, right on. God, it's uh, what a what a, what a wild year it's been. That's like uh, what was what was the last time you um, what was the last time you were up at the Improv? Like uh, like that week? Would you say? Yeah, I think it was um, March. So I think March maybe sixth or something. Maybe the week before. Okay. Yeah, and then I went to Chicago to get engaged and uh celebrate my birthday i actually got engaged on my birthday and then and then the whole world shut down like literally yeah. the day after we got engaged that is one of the yeah, that is such like a wild uh what a wild week that was yeah that was the last time yeah the last time i uh, got up was that week i got uh, i got pulled for lab work and the last uh the last note that i ever got from rita i don't need to wear a suit ha huh. so, <laughs> That was, uh, that, that was the week that I decided to, you know what, I'm going to switch things up. I'm going to try to look TV professional. Um, yeah. Yeah, I like to believe she's right. Yeah. God, yeah, we, it's kind of funny. We all go through those phases in regards to just trying to find, like, the right fit for our stage presence, whether it's, like, a suit or a vest or a leather jacket or, you know, I think we all go through these different periods as comedians as far yeah. as trying to, like, be comfortable on stage with how we appear. I wear a suit quite a bit. You know, when uh, I play Vegas and, you know, for me, it was always like uh, trying to like respect the people that had gone before me. You know, you're in this club, they're paying like $70 a ticket to see you. It's a beautiful club. So a lot of times I wear a suit, but then it looks weird because like, you know, I might wear a suit and then the headliner is wearing like jeans and a vest or jeans and a sweater. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, OK, so but, you know, I got to wear what, what makes me comfortable, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I, I I do like I do I do find uh, sometimes yeah as you're saying like we try to find these things, the like all like these almost like these accessories that we think complements our voice. Yeah, yeah, it's funny. I I remember hearing a story where um, Jamie Masada, who owns the Laugh Factory, told Tony Hinchcliffe that he should wear a cowboy hat. <laughs> <laughs> and I get I did the San Diego Comedy Festival one year. I was doing really well, and then. This uh this owner of a comedy club uh walked up to me and said I should wear a sports jersey while I'm performing. Like you just look like a sports jersey kind of guy. And I'm like, I, well, I mean, I, I like sports, but I don't have any material about sports whatsoever. I don't know why I would wear a sports jersey. Like a bulls jersey? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, just, just, just the thought of Hinchcliffe wearing a wearing a cowboy hat. Just just the thought of like him reacting to that. He's a very very brass person. Oh, I'm sure yeah. he took it with a grain of salt. <laughs> yeah. God, yeah, it's uh Yeah, have you uh, you've been uh getting out over the last couple of weeks as far as uh, stuff out stuff Vegas outside of LA? I did Vegas. Um when did I do that? I think it was uh December. I did the first week in December I did Las Vegas. It was uh Wednesday through Sunday at the MGM Grand at, at Brad Garrett's Comedy Club, but then um and it was like 25% capacity. Okay. Like the last two rows of the comedy clubs. It's like, there's nobody within 25 feet of you. So, you know, they, they take a lot of precautions, you know, for COVID, but it also like kind of takes away from the energy of the show a little bit because like, I like to do crowd work and I like to feed off the energy of the crowd. And, you know, I had like, okay sets, but it just certainly felt like like I didn't have as strong of a connection as I normally do with those types of audiences. And then I went to uh, Texas for a week in Austin and um, it was awesome. Like, you know, as far as like stage time and like getting up, I got up every night, it, whether, you know, even if it was like just an open mic or like just a bar show, um, I was able to get up and, and do like probably like eight or nine different sets um, throughout the week. So it was really cool to go down there and just, you know, like they, you know, they didn't really, they're not as cautious as like LA yeah. is in regards to like their health and safety. I, I wore a mask the whole time because I, you know, I take it, I try to take it seriously, but 
you know, at the same time, it's like, I just felt like I needed to get down there and get some work in and just get on stage and feel like, feel whatever, like feel that energy again of being on stage. So yeah, this, it was worth this, it. This worth the risk for me. It, it is a craft stand up comedy and it, it's hard to find a balance of uh, where, where we should be so focused on the safety of ourselves and others and as well as making sure that when things reopen we aren't just wobbly yeah i mean you know I, and 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 i'm a guy who you know my act is definitely and i think a lot of comedians are discovering this that a lot of our old material isn't really applicable or of you know really flying anymore because there's been so many changes to our society and to our world. So you can't be like, Oh, I was, uh, you know, down in the subway on Tuesday. And it's just like, Oh, subway has been closed for nine months. It's like, Oh, okay. You know, or, you know, a lot of times I open up my act about talking about going, you know, to the middle East and entertaining the troops. But like, you know, it's been like two years since I've done that. So like, you know, eventually there's a, there's a time expiration on jokes and yeah. it seems like that, expiration kind of increased dramatically once we started going into a pandemic so now i'm kind of like just rebuilding a whole new act but in order to do that you need to get on stage and you know you can't really do that i mean you can sit and write for a couple hours a day you know religiously but until you actually do it in front of a live audience you're not going to know whether or not anyone else yeah. thinks it's funny you know not not so, so, not to mention somebody in the uh, comedy store documentary said something very interesting. I forget her name, but she said something along the lines like you have to experience the joke. Yeah. Which I, yeah, we, I found that to be very profound. Yeah, we have to like muscle memory. We have to live it. You know, we got to live a life. I remember uh, you know when I first moved to LA, a comedian asking me kind of like what what my writing process was and I said, "Well, a lot of times I try to go it, like where life is happening so whether like I, I sometimes i would go to like the courthouse and like just watch like court sometimes or like i'll go to a mall or i'll go to like these different areas you know and just kind of witness life happening you know and just kind of like write write down like what's going on around me and yeah. you know but but you know if you're one of these these comics and there's nothing against them i'm not but like if you're doing like four or five mics a night and you're trying to grind away and you're like trying to get better but you're not experiencing life or you're not living life i told one comedian i'm like go get dumped <laughs> like yeah. go get go get your heart broken you know it's the best way to like write is to like be sad or like have an emotion oh god the best thing that ever happened because i was one of those four or five mics a night people yeah for a while yeah. and it's like the having all of that taken away just for a bit and yeah like i like i'm now I, like for the first time i feel like i have meaningful friendships with a lot of comics where they're, they're just not passerbys that I'll see at a bar or a club. Yeah. I, I, you know, I had a real, uh, it was very humbling, um, going through this pandemic because, you know, after like the honeymoon period wore off after a couple of months where like, Oh, I get to like get up and watch TV and just kind of like putz around. And I, you know, at first I embraced it because it was nice to kind of just slow down because I, you know, I do like 40 weeks a year on the road you know, and so for me, I'm, I'm constantly out on the road working and for me to just completely stop, you know, it helped me kind of reset and, you know, but then like after the first couple of months, I began to realize like how much of who I am was stand up, you know, and yeah. was comedy and was my career. And, you know, it forced you to kind of change perspectives. It forced you to kind of like, you know, embrace the people around you, like you said, and, you know, whether it's other comedians or, you know, my relationship with my wife or like my relationship with my family and friends. And, you know, it, it was, it was a blessing in disguise, but at the same time, it was a rude awakening to realize how much of me was entrenched in comedy. Yeah. Uh, that's something, cause that's something I also think we took for granted. The fact that, uh, like, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the first time in the history of stand-up comedy, which is still, in the scheme of things, a very new art form. This is the first time that things turned so sideways that it stopped for months and months, like at least six months until there was any paid work available. Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously different areas of the country had yeah. different views on on when they would open and then I know some areas open and then 
fall and winter came and, you know, the numbers went back up and it closed. But I, you know, I did, I think in, in October, I did Wichita, I did Little Rock. And, you know, they assured me like, oh yeah, we're going to be at like 50% capacity. And then I get there and like Saturday is sold out, you know, completely. So it's like, yeah. you know, like, like they left like one table in front of the stage open, but you know, at the same time as a comedian, I'm just like, I, I really like just wanted to do the shows, yeah. you know? And, you know, I don't want to sound um, melodramatic and say, oh, well, I'm, I'm willing to die for this thing, but it was just like, I'm, I'm willing to take on some risk, you know? Yeah. So you know, because I love the work that I do and I love, I love making people laugh and entertaining people. That was the, uh, I, I was willing, I'm not willing to die for comedy, but I'm willing to get arrested for it. That was like my yeah. attitude at the very beginning. Right. Fact, there was somebody, uh, there was somebody, I don't know if you know Joe Bando, but he was hosting a mic down in Long Beach. And like when when we got there, like I swear to God, like I I thought like the police were gonna bust in at any moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. I mean, I, that that'd be cool. Like they get it, it, like immediately gives you street cred if you get it, arrested. You know, it would it would give you street <laughs> cred, but at the same time, like I don't think I have the nerves to deal with. Uh, or at least at the time, I don't think I ha I would have the nerves. Like God forbid, that became like a national story. Right. Even though, why would it be? Right. Yeah. yeah. Plus, I can't imagine. I mean, could you imagine being the policeman who like has to like make that arrest? <laughs> like, yeah. Oh God. Like, there's so much going on in the world right now, and I gotta arrest some comedians that are trying to like do an open mic at a beach. You know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, like the, the show that we've been producing, uh, me Ben Hurwitz and stuff. Like, uh, we've always had in the back of our minds, like, what if the police? show up but they haven't because there's just so many other things to worry about yeah i guess my biggest complaint about this whole situation is just the inconsistency in regards to like this place can be open but that yeah. has to be closed and that can be a quarter open but this place is completely done like the fact that you're closing like a small ma pa hardware store that's going to have like maybe 20 or 30 customers throughout the day yeah. versus like having 200 people in a home depot. Yes. Like it didn't, it didn't make any sense to me. And, you know, a lot of these, like, especially in the West coast, like the improvs, I was talking to the management and they're like, yeah, like we're a restaurant, but they're treating us as a performance venue. So like, we're not able to open because we're technically a performance venue, you know, but a restaurant that like, um, uh, what is it called? Cheesecake Factory, which is twice the size of any improv, you know, well, they're going to be open at, you know, 50% capacity. So, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. I, I actually joked the other day at the improv open mic that, you know, hey, I go, if you're going to open back up, why, why don't you go ahead and just leave a microphone and a speaker available? <laughs> like, yeah. You know, we'll just, we'll just like sneak attack, like guerrilla warfare, the, the stand-up comedy for the people that are there, you know? Yeah. And I, I like, I felt for, uh, cause I like, a lot of like the paid regulars at the comedy store were frustrated because uh, like uh, they were forced to close. Whereas Saddle Ranch was just packed. right next door. Yeah, yeah. Next door. Yeah. It's, it's insane. Or you're performing through a window. Like it, it's just, I, I, I've always thought from the beginning that people should be responsible for their own health and safety and making their own decisions. Now I understand that, I could, you know, take this virus home and infect, yeah. you know, countless people. So I understand that as well. But like, you know, I, I, I would, I would rather everything shut down and it, it all be equal versus like this, like mix and match, like, well, yeah. you can be open, but you can't, and you can, you know, so I, I just doesn't make any sense to me, you know, that there's, there was such inconsistency depending on, where you live or what type of business you are, you know, I, I mean, me doing an outdoor show, you know, a, a, a comedy in the round or something in a park during the day, like the minimum, the, the risk for exposure is very minimum versus like doing a very small, tiny comedy club. that's hundred percent filled in Nashville, you know? Yeah. So. But, uh, apparently like the CDC also updated their guideline guidelines, like, uh, like, they want you to get tested if you've been inside with someone without a mask in like an enclosed space for like more than 15 minutes. Um, like, yeah. like it, it's becoming more and more. We're learning a little bit more, like as far as like the outdoor transmission rate is really low. 
Yeah, from what I've read, and, I, and yeah. again, I'm not a I'm not a doctor. I don't I don't study this stuff, but like, for, from what I've kind of read, you know, it seems like, you know, outdoors it's very low risk. It's like when you're indoors and you're circulating the same amount of air. Yeah. That you know you have to be exposed to the virus for you know five like t- five minutes, ten minutes, or whatever, versus like you're outside and and breathing up or wearing a mask, you know. I don't know. I just think from the beginning and, and I'm not, you know, I don't want to like get into politics, but I just yeah. think it was like really bad leadership and just, yeah. you know, really bad disseminating information to people. And now we're just kind of stuck in this like no man's land of like, well, can we open? Can't we open? I mean, nobody knows. I, you know? I, th- I think we've had uh, this has overall been a very traumatizing experience. And yeah, I, th- I think what happened, particularly with July when we thought we were in the tail end of this and no, nope. I flew back. Yeah. I was, <laughs> I was staying in Chicago and I got, I literally got married July 18th. We packed the car July 25th. And then we were, we drove back uh, to LA from Chicago and I'm like, this is going to be great. Everything's going to like open back up. Yeah. And we got here and they're like, Nope, we're locking down again, but you're going to get parking tickets. Like it's like, yeah. so it's so weird oh. to me how, you know, one th- one thing is decided like, oh well, we're gonna start writing parking tickets again, but like no one can go out at all. Like, okay, well, how can I move my car technically? You know. Oh yeah, that was. Uh, I, re- I remember the first parking ticket I got. I I was gonna lose my mind. Like, yeah, was... we we got we. My wife and I both got parking tickets on Christmas Eve, and we 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 caught the guy like writing the ticket, and he was like. He was really cool. Like he's just doing his job, but I'm like, yeah. dude, I'm like, first of all, it's Christmas Eve. Take a day <laughs> off. I go, and second of all, like, we're on a, technically we're on a lockdown. So like, why are we, why are you even ticketing? He's like, you're preaching to the choir, bro. He's like, I don't want to be out here. And I'm like, oh, all right. Yeah. You know, and I still kicked his ass, but you know. <laughs> were, uh, were, were you, uh, were you doing any comedy in Chicago at all? No, I mean, no. it was pretty much locked down. I, I remember, yeah. I remember, uh, I think it was May, maybe I did like an open mic. But even then, you still like you're on stage and you have this thing in the back of your head going like, is this terribly irresponsible? Like, am I making a big mistake here? You know, and, you know, we like we're it's an open mic. So like everyone's like sharing a mic. They're, they're like, cha- like wiping off the mic in between every comic. But I'm like, I, you know, and, and I like ended up going toward the tail end of the, the mic. But I was like, I don't even know. And, and the other thing is, like, I went to Austin for a week and it's wide open. Like they're literally yeah. like spitting in each other's mouths when you get there. And, uh, and I'm like, okay, cool. I got like, uh, an hour of stage time throughout the week, which is good. But I mean, when's the next time I'm getting on stage? You know, I don't, I don't really know, you know? So it's like, there's just no consistency to get out and perform. But when, when it's available, I definitely would do it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's the thing I've, uh, for me, I've been traveling with my own microphone. Yeah. For the, for that very reason. It's like, I don't, yeah, I don't want to risk getting sick or others. And like I like I think I'm as responsible as I could be without just staying home all the time, which I can't. Uh, I I, yeah. I can't process the idea. Like what we are about, we are about to hit the one year mark since March 11th. Yeah. Just like the thought, like there are people who haven't done comedy since then, and the thought that that could have been me, like that horrifies me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I I just did a show on Valentine's Day in like the OC, outdoor. Yeah, everyone's wearing a mask. They're spaced out. I get I, I got out of my car, said hello, got on stage, got off stage, <laughs> got back in my car. You know what I mean? But like, so like that's what I'm doing to like make sure that I manage my own health and safety. But you know, um, but those sh- shows are like few and far between. You know, and those opportunities yeah. to do those. But you know, for for stand ups, it's like you know, we have to get on stage. Like we have to like consistently be out there just like, uh, I mean, anybody, a circus performer, an athlete, like, you know, we need to be out there fine tuning the things that we're doing in our act. And if we're not out there, you know, you're going to feel it. I I remember a lot of the shows that I started doing, it's like every comedian would get up there and be like, Oh man, I'm so rusty. I haven't done. I'm like, don't, don't say that. Like just fake it till you make it, you know? Oh yeah. Commit. Yeah, just yeah. be like, you know, all right. Well, I forgot my act. That, that is pretty funny, though, is that aspect of watching people like literally forget their act. You know, I mean, that happened to me a couple times. Where I'm like, I don't, I don't really know. 
what, then, how this where this joke ends you know i know the punchline but i'm like i'm missing that little middle piece and then there are the handful i've seen a handful of comics like get up for like their one of their first times since all this and they were they were doing like the same like five minutes from like like uh six to ten months ago yeah and, yeah uh, yeah, because I because again, you don't know if the new stuff that you've been writing. It's like yeah. how many how many Tiger King jokes can you write, you know? And and you know, so it, it's it's kind of weird because number one, you haven't been on stage for like nine months, so you're going to be rusty, obviously. And then number two, it's like you 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 want to be able to be comfortable on stage, so you're not you don't really want to start off with your new shit because you have no idea if it's going to work or not, and so now you're just like this shriveling mess on stage because number one you're rusty and number two you're trying to do new stuff that hasn't been proved proved out yet yeah so for me like going down to austin and just being like all right i'm gonna bomb for a straight week if i have to <laughs> you know and just make sure I, I i would literally go down the set list and be like that worked that didn't work i had to change this i had to change you know so for me it was more like doing my homework and really kind of like trying to find out whether or not this new stuff has legs and you know like almost almost right away whether or not it's going to work you know yeah, yeah I, I sort of get the i might i'm at least able to find the rhythm of something before i start like uh whether or not like i think it'll resonate with an audience if i'm comfortable doing it then i at least know that okay like this is falls within the parameters of my truth let's go from there yeah and and if it's relatable you know i was, I was doing this bit about like you know, I, I noticed a lot of people were doing puzzles during the pandemic. So I wrote this bit about the guy at the puzzle factory, like losing his because, you know, he has to work overtime now. But like, you know, like the first couple of weeks of the pandemic, like I would do some Zoom shows and it was crushing. And then like I go down to Texas and it's like getting this like lukewarm response because like I said, every joke has an expiration to it. Yeah. Some are some are some are more than others. You know, I you're going to see a lot of people that just don't want to hear about trump or politics anymore you know when this thing opens up and <laughs> oh i know. know i argue they didn't uh yeah, like they over the past four like it was yeah by god though those for that first year after uh 2016 like i get people's frustrations but wow was it uncomfortable <laughs> it's going to be really interesting like going out and doing stand-up again with as divisive as our country is right now you know what I mean? Because, you know, what what flies in Wichita versus Vegas versus uh, New York, you know what yeah. I mean? You know, versus L.A., it's all different. You know what I mean? And, and you know, a, a good comedian will tell you, well, you know what? I'm going to do my jokes and f it. either you like it or you don't, you know, and I and that's kind of like the approach that I take. But, you know, it's still there's a, it's a little nerve wracking knowing whether or not, you know, you're going to be in the Midwest and they're going to be open to like, you know, some of the material or not, you know, but yeah, I think that's part of the fun of it as well. It's just seeing if you can get people on your side. Oh yeah. That, that's uh that's a weakness I have right now. Cause I have not gotten up outside of Southern California. Like I've, I've been able to drive down to Escondido. I've been able to Escondido. Yeah. I've, I've been able to uh, do a hit the American comedy company back when they were doing, Oh, they're actually they're actually back, but uh, yeah, they're doing outdoor shows now. But but I feel like Ventura is like the closest I've gotten to small town America, and even that's a stretch. Oh, you go to like I remember going to Little Rock, and and the guys guys like maybe don't mention you're from L.A. <laughs> I was just like, why? I, and then he's like, maybe don't do crowd work. You know, this is Little Rock, and I'm like, I don't care, dude. Like they're I, <laughs> I know what I'm doing. They're gonna be fine. You know. I've heard people like uh, people have said that before that if you leave LA to do comedy, do not tell people you're from LA because it just like discredits you. Well, but I, 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 yeah, I don't think it discredits you. I just think people have preconceived notions about, you know, we're all like, you know, hippies living in our, you know, electron electric cars, you know, yeah. like, and we're My just like, you know, looking for handouts and don't want to work. Whereas, you know, having moved here seven years ago, I was really pleasantly surprised at how much, how similar people are in California to most of the people I've met in our country. You know, it's obviously a, a subsection of douchebags like there are in any yeah. geography, but, you know, um, 
I've always been really, I've always really dug where I, where I live. And people ask me like, oh, would you move back to Chicago? And I'm like, I love Chicago. It's my favorite city, but like, I love it out here. I love the people here, the weather. Like, I love the comedy scene, you know, and this is where I, I want to do my work. You yeah. Know? For, for a split second, I thought about mo- like uh, moving back to New York while this, all this blows over and like the, the weather was a deciding factor, but also just yeah. the fact that it's like this New York is, is getting hit as well. Like, going down it's going down like la but uh yeah i mean you're not gonna like you know and a lot of people are moving to austin right now you know joe rogan brian redband tony hitchcliffe uh joey diaz moved back to jersey and theo vaughn went to um nashville and i think tom segura is going down to austin so theo vaughn Vaughn left wow i didn't know that yeah yeah Yeah, he's gone tom segura is in austin yeah so um and, and I get it because it's open and th- those guys want to get up and they want to like perform. And, and I embrace that, but you know, those guys in my opinion are, not, are a lot more established than I am. And I'm like, you know, this is where I want to be because maybe now it's my time to move up the food chain and start getting more and more spots that now are vacant because these guys have left. Yeah. I, de- I definitely see like that, that's something that I've wondered in terms like what is it going to do to the ecosystem when things reopen? Are people who've been working for years going to start uh going to start getting on showcases more like yourself or are people who are fighting to get a chance for uh to serve a club in some way like are they going to start getting time uh well the bookers still have slots to fill you know what yeah. I mean? So, you know, they still have to provide a product to their, their customer base. And, you know, the fact that, you know, Joe Rogan, Tony Hitchcliffe and, and those guys and Joey Diaz, they're not here anymore. That's three more spots times five or seven, seven nights. So that's 21 more spots minimum that are open. You know what I mean? That, that, you know, guys, you know, like us can fill in, you know, yeah. so not that we're at that level yet, but like yeah. those guys were, where we were at one point as well. So it's just taking advantage of your opportunities. And that's, yeah. you know, me, like I would, I would feel l- luckier than you could ever possibly imagine if I was even able to get up like in front of whoever, like I, I've, I've heard through the grapevine that uh, Adam might not be booking at the store anymore. Yeah, but well, like, I mean, like if I got like if I got up in the in front of the Booker instead of once every three years, once every four months. Yeah, which doesn't yeah. feel like a lot, but still. L- yeah, to, I mean, to give you last time I got up, uh, mm-hmm. last time I got up on potluck, Jay Light was a door guy. <laughs> Just, oh wow, <laughs> he was the guy hosting. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, it's it's um, you know, but you know, you just gotta like LA comedy is very cyclical, right? So like the comedy store right now is like the pinnacle. It's the gold standard, you know, but like 10 years ago, nobody was going there and everyone was going to the improv or like five years ago, it was a laugh factory, you know? And so like, you know, or the ice house is like consistently been, you know, one of the top clubs. So, yeah. you know, and now they have new ownership and now I just saw there's a new club opening up in North Hollywood. So, you know, it's just, you just gotta, I hate to sound cliche, but like you just keep grinding away and just keep trying to, you know, just keep showing up. One of the things that this pandemic has really, is really introduced me to a lot of comics that I didn't even know, you know, cause they just, you know, they're, they're not the type of people that go out every night and try to get up. And so, uh, you know, I've met a lot of these new comedians like uh, Justin Matson and, yeah. and um, Natisha Anderson and, you know, um, uh, both great. Yeah, I mean, um, I can't. I'm drawing a blank on the other one. Josh Ogle, you know, these yeah. guys, these are people I never even heard of that I think are absolutely hilarious. Uh, oh god, Josh is fantastic. Kayla Esmond, yeah. Kayla, yeah, his yeah. girlfriend. I mean, they're they're hilarious, but you know, for some reason, they just weren't the people that were out like getting up. And I and I and of course, you know, I've told them like, you know, once we open up, you got to get out there and, and yeah. you got to like you know, you, you got to like put your time in and do the work, you know, and it's not that they're not, it's just that, you know, I, I think I, I see a lot of people, you know, because I've been here for like seven years now that like will move here and then just not go to the clubs or like get turned off by the process. 
And, you know, like, well, well, I was the biggest thing. And, you know, you know, in Chicago, when I left Chicago, I was, I'm headlining, you know, and then all of a sudden I move here and nobody gave, nobody gave like the first show I ever did was, um, I had, I went after, um, who was it? Uh, Damon Wayans. (laughs) I (laughs) So I was like, I was like, Oh man, what did I do? Like, I'm like, I'm like, I'm in, I'm, I'm really swimming with the, the big fish now. So yeah, I would just love to see some of these people that have really been comfortable in a virtual environment, you know, out at the club and, and getting, getting the opportunities that they should, they should be getting, because that's the thing, man, like the, the train never stops. There's always new people that are coming into the scene, you know, and, you know, every year there's, you know, 10, 15, 20 new comics that I'm meeting, you know, that, you know, are, are really great and really funny comics that are looking to make, you know, their place here in, in LA. And yeah comedy i i do find uh about yeah i do know a lot of people who've uh i i know, I know one particular guy who he's been on conan and was signing up for potluck right next to me in line yeah so, it's yeah. insane to me yeah i i remember um jenny Se- jenny segrino did conan and then she got evicted from her apartment the next day you know what I mean? So it's just, you know, and then she was doing the open mic at the ice house the next day, you know, I was like, weren't you on Conan last night? And she's like, it doesn't matter. Like yeah. that was just, that was yesterday. And now today I'm work. I'm at an open mic doing it, you know? And, and for me, it's like, you know, I, I've, I've either hosted the ice house open mic for several years. And then I moved to doing lab work at the Hollywood improv for several years. And, you know, I would love to say like, well, I've, I've kind of moved beyond hosting open mics, but like, I love doing it. I love hosting. I love yeah. hanging out with my comedy brothers and sisters. Like I, I do it because I love it. I, I don't really like, you know, and, and, you know, it's, it's an, another opportunity to like be on stage and to like get better. And so for me, it's like, you know, find your niche and whether it's going to be like emceeing, you know, now I get paid to host you know, corporate events and they pay big bucks because I now have the experience to be able to host a thing for two or three hours. You, you know? also so, get to meet really cool people. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like still to this day, one of my favorite stories of uh, lab work is just Macy Gray showing up. <laughs> it was crazy. Yeah. She's just sitting in the back yeah. and she was, ha- she was literally hanging with Mark Curry, hanging with Mr. Cooper. He had <laughs> done the show. He had done this show before. And I just saw, I go, is that Macy Gray? And I said, hey, do you want to, I, I just walked up to her. I go, do you want to go on stage? And she's like, you want me to tell jokes? And I was like, yeah, go tell a joke. And she went up there and told like three street jokes. And of course it's lab work. So it's a room full of comedians. So they hated her guts. But you, you know. I would have like, I would have just been fascinated. I wouldn't even, I wish you didn't, wouldn't tell jo- like street, jo- like any jokes really. I would just love to hear a story. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. She probably had like a, I would imagine, because she's one of those people who got into the spotlight very quickly, and like there has to be like, just like the emotional stakes of that. I don't, I don't know, like not that she, uh, not that she go home, goes home every night and thinks, you know what, I should write a story that will, like, like I should be a storyteller. I don't know, like. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, everyone's got a story to tell, but especially when you've, you've made it to a certain level, you know, and, and, and what I found interesting is that, cause I think I saw her again at the ha ha, you know, and then she's just, and then I saw, I rounds. saw the, I saw the Laker, the owners of the Laker, Jenny bus at, and she, I saw her do an open mic at the ha ha. And I walked up to her afterwards. I go, so what, like, what made you want to do stand up? She's like, I don't know. She's like, I always wanted to do it. She goes, I love stand up. And I just wanted to give it a shot. And she paid five bucks to, to do five minutes or maybe she did 10 minutes or whatever. And, you know, she, she did it. You know, she was talking about doing brunch with her friends and things you would expect a rich white woman to talk about, you know, but it, it's just, that's what I love about this, um, this, this art and this craft is that like, you just get to do cool, shit, you know, uh, Carmen Morales, uh, who's one of the door, uh, people at the comedy store she had the best quote she's like she said comedians get to do uh comedians are poor people that get to do rich people <laughs> you know? okay i could uh and i, I get down with that i love that man you know because like it's like i've experienced some of the some of the things i've experienced in my life like i i could never 
in a million years thought I'd be in that situation or in that room, you know, writing things for like, you know, uh, Charlize Theron and Orlando Bloom and Rosario Dawson and like, like literally like they're, they're writing the words that I'm putting in the teleprompter and, you know, and, and being in a, a C-130 above I, a Baghdad, Iraq at midnight, you know, wearing night vision goggles or, you know, you know I mean, like, it's just like, it's this cool life. And for me, it's like, having come from corporate America and like living a nine to five job, you know, and being married and having a house in the burbs and an SUV and like a doll, like all the things you thought you're supposed to have. Like I, I didn't want any of that stuff. And, and wow. I'm, I'm married now, but I'm like yeah. the, the wife that I'm married to now only knows me as a stand-up comic, you know? And like, that's like, she's, she's accepted that life and, and the life that I live and, you know, we get to do cool shit because of it sometimes. You know? What were you doing before stand up? Uh, I was in uh, corporate sales. So I spent 13 years in corporate sales. I worked for a company called Dun and Bradstreet for 10 years. Uh, then I worked for another um, investor relations firm. And then I worked for NASDAQ. I was the managing director at NASDAQ for just under a year. And um, that's like, I, I was like basically had this dream job where I was like just playing golf with CFOs of fortune 500 companies. And I remember one day I was just like, I, I just don't want to do this anymore. Like, I just want to do stand up. Like, do you like remember as, your first mic? Like, yeah, what? my, yeah, my first mic, I, I actually did in Chicago um, at a club called riddles comedy club. And uh, I was, cause I lost a bet. Um, a, a buddy of mine, <laughs> It was like, it was like a buddy, of, a buddy of mine was going to join the Navy and he was like 25 and like nine 11 had just happened. And he's like, I'm going to join the Navy. And I'm like, dude, you're, like, you're 25. Nobody joins the Navy. He goes, if I, if I join the Navy, he goes, will you do stand up before I leave? I go, yeah, I'll do stand up. And then he joined the Navy the next day and did four years in the Navy or five. And then I did stand up before he went for to boot camp. And I brought like 30 people with me. I still have it on tape. It's on VHS tape. That's how wow. fucking how... old I am. Um, but yeah, it was, and I brought notes on stage that were like typed out like a script. And, you know, I watch it now and I like, of course I'm like, oh, this, it's, it, I can't even hardly watch more than 30 seconds of it. But at the time it felt great. Like I felt like I got off stage and I remember the MC who was like, you know, I, like to me when you first start like the mc was like bigger than life you know like this guy's doing it he's hosting an open mic and uh i remember he's like is that really your first time and i'm like yeah he's like he's like keep coming back but then like i didn't come back for like a month or something like my 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 origin story is really screwed up because i never wanted to do like stand up full time like i did it like once a month like like when I look at the people that I've started with, like literally it's like the who's who in Hollywood right now. Um, uh, I started with TJ. I started with Hannibal Burris. I started wow. with um, Beth Stelling, I, like all these people that are like killing it. Uh, Kyle Kinane, like, right on. and, and I was just like this guy that was like, Oh, I'll go do like one open mic a month, you know? And then like, I was like, Oh, I'm never going to quit my job. Like my life is, about money and it's about like success and material possessions and like i'm gonna be like this successful businessman and then just the more and i did stand up you know and then of course you start emceeing on weekends and then like they moved me up to feature quickly and then all of a sudden i started like headlining off nights and i and then every weekend like i would punch out and i would just go to like wisconsin or indiana or michigan like within driving distance and like I was always just trying to get a weekend booked. And then finally one day after I got divorced and I was working at NASDAQ making like boatloads of money, I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. Like I can't keep pretending to be something that I'm not, you know? And, and I, I just sold my house and got rid of my Lexus and <laughs> just packed my bag and moved to California, you know? And that was it. Wow. You know? And now you've, uh, you're able to cover all your bills doing comedy. Yeah. I, I, I like dream. to joke. <laughs> I, I joke that I, I moved here with the clothes on my back and $52,000 in the bank. So 
<laughs> like it wasn't really a struggle because I had saved so much money before I came here. But you know, yeah, it's, it's a good. It's good to have that Easter egg ready. <laughs> yeah, and I tell people that want to move out here. I'm like, dude, you have no idea. Like just the parking tickets alone, like you can't even imagine. Like, and and milk and gas and food are, are all more expensive. So like whatever you think you're going to come out here with, like come out with twice that amount. And yeah, that way you can have yourself a little bit of a buffer because, you know, as soon as you move out here, the, the transmission goes or you need new tires or like, you got to like go to the DMV and get your plates changed for $8,000. It's, it's frustrating, you know, when you first move here. Yeah. There's a, I, I just started a new job and one of my coworkers just moved here and like, he's, Real, like he's definitely like trying to get on his feet uh yeah and like like he, he but like his, his story is a little bit uh it's not like he moved here like to try to be an actor or a comedian like he like he ended up here he's from louisiana and uh they got hit hard by uh two hurricanes in august yeah and it, it, it's like um like like yeah he's really trying to get on his feet this is a very hard it's city tough, to do it in i've always said i go la is designed to get you to leave like yeah. that's that's the city like it's it's expensive like it's it's unforgiving you know especially in stand-up you know and i see it a lot of times uh, with like canadian comedians yeah. and and there's some of the funniest comedians in the world but like you know canada embraces comedy so much that a lot of these guys are doing like theaters and like you know making like a fortune up there and then they come to la and they're like get in line like yeah. no one gives no Brutal. one gives you you know and now all of a sudden they're like shell shocked and going like oh man like i i can't when i came here i was like just don't have a chip on your shoulder because nobody knows who you are like you know i, I had a pretty good reputation in chicago and i was like but when i came out here i literally knew one person and I met Jay Light, like was the first person I think I met because he was working at Flappers at the time. Yeah. And I like I made friends with him and then I made friends with Joe Marisi, you know, because he was from Chicago and talked like I did. And so, you know, but then like every night I would just go do mics and then end up at the comedy store. And slowly but surely I knew one people and then I knew two people and then I knew five and ten and, you know, but you know, the other thing I tell a lot of people that move here, it's like, get involved, man. Like, try, yeah. to, try to find, you know, you look at like Brett Erickson. He was the longtime uh, house MC at the uh, Jukebox Comedy Club in Peoria. And he moved out here and he started like producing podcasts and like, like really helping out at the store. I know you've been involved at the, at the store quite a bit. And, you know, looking at like what happened with Roast Battle. And so for me, when the opportunity came and they're like, Hey, we want you to host an open mic at the improv. I'm like, yes, absolutely. Because you don't know, like now I have guys from that book, the tonight show and Conan that come out to lab work that want to see their guy. But like, I, and, and I'm like, cool, like, you know, stay, stick around for two or three comics and maybe you'll, you'll see somebody, you know? And, and when, when Jamie Flam was involved with lab work, he would have those big, you know, he would bring industry in to look at like the new up and coming comedians, you know? And so, you know, at the end of the day, just like, like take it, take a minute. I see so many guys, especially like on Facebook and on social media that really struggle with the grind. And, and, and I would just tell everyone just to kind of like, just try to enjoy these times, you know, enjoy like, like where you're at right now, you're grinding away, you know, you're writing new material. Every time I see you at, at, right club or the open mic like you're working on new shit. you know I, I see progression in jokes and you're doing it man and you're not bitter and you're not angry and you're not complaining and you're not like I don't putting show up all it, these but yeah i mean exactly yeah. like you know you don't show it but like yeah the, you know if show business were easy everyone would do it you know because it's a cool life but you know I, I just tell everyone just to just to really enjoy the process and don't get you know because you know i've had so many people especially hosting lab work that like have been really rude to me and like shitty to me because they're not getting up. And I'm like, dude, this isn't a personal vendetta. I don't, yeah, I'm not, I'm not against you. Like I'm not like stacking the deck against you. Like, it's just, it so is what it is. is. You know what I mean? It, it is what it is, but it's just like, but I, I am like the biggest comedy fan and I want people to succeed. Um, So don't, don't burn bridges. Attitude has a lot to do with it, man. I, I like my, my mentor is, is Brad Garrett. He owns that club in Vegas. We've been like friends for a few years and 
the way I see how he treats people. And this guy is like a multimillionaire. He's had multiple television shows, but like he would literally give you the shirt off his back, you know, just to like do something nice for somebody. And like, and like, don't forget, like, that's, that's part of like what it means to like be a professional comedian is like how you treat the wait staff and the bartender and the guy park in your car and like everybody from, from, from top to bottom, like treat everybody with respect and kindness. And, yeah. you know, I can be a sarcastic, like, you know, asshole at lab work, but that's just part <laughs> of the fun. You know what I mean? But like, it's never personal. I'm yeah. never like, Oh, I hate this guy. Or, you know, I can't stand Nick country. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> like, like I, I, you know, I, hope, I hope he makes it and hires me, you know, like I miss the out of nick country wherever he is <laughs> uh, yeah i i'm surprised I, I wouldn't be surprised if he's like trading bitcoin and like a yeah. multi-billionaire right now oh my god <laughs> no but uh michael Rogilio is talking uh, related to what you're saying michael Rogilio is telling a story he was up in tahoe and he was very good about when he first got there he wanted to make sure he did everything right so he introduced himself to the manager the other comedians the wait staff and like he just wanted to make a positive first impression and yeah and then he ate well <laughs> you know what that's but yeah, he, yeah he rewrote his set throughout the entire weekend um yeah that, well, there you go yeah. like that's a win you know what yeah, I mean yeah he's, like... he's a professional but, you know, a lot of these guys that have been like grinding in L.A., you know, and trying to make the back of the room laugh and make your comic buddies laugh. It's very different when you're in Tahoe, you know, so like learn learn how to be a comedian. And I say this a lot at Write Club, which is the the writer's workshop that I run for free every Friday, which is like, look, like try to like build your act around what everyone's going to laugh at, not just the back of the room or not, you know, just you know, that subsection of people that you're trying to get la like laugh, you know, be true to who you are. And, and, but like, but at the same time, like for me, it's like, when I write this joke, is there a version of this joke that's really going to kill in Wichita and New York and Istanbul or where, you know, where, yeah. wherever I'm going to perform, like, you know, I, I want to be able to walk into any room and kill, you know? And, and for me, like, that's, that's really important. And that's why I think I get the work that I get because I've, I found that if I built an act around, you know, not only the jokes that I love and the material I love doing, that's relatable, but also like, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't like alienate anybody. Like anyone can laugh, whether it's a cruise or a corporate or whatever it's, and I'm not a clean comic. I mean, I yeah. talk about edgy, shit, you know, but at the same time, I want to write a joke that like everyone can relate to and everyone's going to get versus you like. Go ahead. Oh no! Yeah, I was gonna ask. Do you find like uh, the other part of the world, other parts of the world? You've done mo done mostly army bases, USO shows. Yeah. So like, yeah, and you go out there, and they're like so. I mean, those shows were the best shows I've ever done in my life because they were so grateful. You know, they were so grateful that you took the time to like fly twenty hours in a plane to like land in the middle of a war zone and and entertain them in the back of a truck. You know, and like and then the iraqi people like treated you like you were a rock star and wanted your autograph and a picture wow. with you and you know i've got like all these like uh, like cool iraqis like follow me on instagram and like do you, uh, <laughs> do you find like that there that there's comedy that uh resonates both whether it be it like at the looney bin like in in wichita or little rock or ends like a place like Baghdad, like in front of yeah, because we've all been culture. we've all been divorced, we've all been dating, we've all been dumped, we've all have a boss, we've all had bad jobs, we've all, you know, like the things that link us together as humans are is way more overwhelming than our differences, in my opinion. You know what I mean? Like you know, so I can go into uh, Baghdad or you know Saudi Arabia or anywhere and like. People are going to get it. I, I, I'll tell you this story. I did a, a black room one time in Chicago and I tried doing material about going to a black funeral and I was pandering, you know, and I was young and it was like, I was really, really new in stand up, and I ate a huge piece of, I ate, I bombed terribly and they hated me. And so then I just avoided black rooms. I'm like, well, black people don't get me and I'm not going to do it. And then one, all of a sudden I got a call one day a couple of years later and hey man our, our headliner missed their flight can you come do this room and i knew it was a black room and i'm like yeah all right i'll come do it and 
I, I told, I was driving there and I go, just do your act, do your act. Like that's it. Now I grew up in on the South side of Chicago. So it's, it, you'd have to understand it's very segregated. There's black neighborhood and a Mexican neighborhood and a white neighborhood and an Irish neighborhood. And you know what I mean? A Puerto Rican neighborhood. So right. it's very segregated. And even though I went to school with a, a public school with blacks and Latinos and stuff like that, for the most part, like you, you think like, Oh, well I have to like, I, I want a black room to think I'm a cool white guy. But when I went in there and just did my act, they were like, I, they're like, you're one of the funniest headliners we've ever had. And everyone walked up to me is like, oh, bro, I remember drinking from the hose when we were kids. Oh, man, I remember building that cardboard fort. Oh, man. And, and it was my own ignorance and naivety to think that, oh, black people aren't going to get me because I grew up a certain way, where the reality was is we all grew up the same way. You know what I mean? Like, I just made these terrible assumptions based on the way I was raised. You know what I'm saying? So for me, it's like, like do more, most importantly, do material that you love because you're going to love doing that the most. But secondly, like make sure that that material can speak to everyone. And, and again, I think that's easy to do because we're very similar as human beings, regardless of our race, ethnicity, gender, sex, all that stuff. Like it doesn't matter. Like, I think, I, I think part of the problem that we're facing as a society is that the people that want to point out the differences have the loudspeaker versus the people that really want to point out the similarities that we have to one another. That's, a, that's, a, that's I could get down with that entirely. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that, yeah, those are beautiful words. Except Jews, right? Except <laughs> the Jews. <laughs> Oh, we're the worst. <laughs> uh, no, yeah, it's um, God. So, you, how long were you doing uh, comedy in Chicago before you uh, were you doing like the Laugh Factory out there? Yeah, I, I, it's so funny. The Laugh Factory had just opened, and I got my first um, rehe- uh, not rehearsal audition in front of Jamie. Uh, the day I uh left Nasdaq. So I left NASDAQ 2013 on August, on July 31st. And that night I had my audition to get passed at the, at the, at the laugh factory in Chicago. And, you know, the set went really well. And Jamie called me over and he's like, look, buddy, you're very funny. You know, you're going to be great. Um, and I go, Jamie, I'm, I'm moving to LA. I go, would it be possible to, you know, come and audition for you again in Los Angeles? He's like, yes, absolutely, buddy. Call me. And of course, it wasn't like two years until I got an audition at the Laugh Factory in L.A. But, you know, um, yeah, I did stand up probably around 10 years in Chicago before moving to L.A. Because I, I, again, I thought I was living a very different life. I thought I was going to be married with kids and like have a job and just do stand up for fun as a hobby. And then all of a sudden it became this life, this choice. And so for me. I didn't want to move to LA until I had like a strong 45 minute act, you know, like, and, and again, uh, the naivety was I'm going to, you know, I'm going to come here humble and not have a chip on my shoulder, but I'm ready. You know what I mean? I'm ready from Netflix. I'm ready for comedy central. Like I'm not going to release a new album because maybe comedy central will want to give me a half hour special. And like none of that happened. And what I realized when I moved to LA was like, I've got some really funny Midwest jokes you know what I mean? But like, I'm not up there. Like, like LA taught me how to be a comedian. Like Chicago taught me how to be funny, but LA taught me how to be a comedian. You know what I'm saying? So when I go from like playing a room with 400 people, making 400 people laugh is easy because nobody wants to be left out. You make 40 people laugh. The other 360 come, come on board because uh, like psychologically, they don't want to be left behind. Like, Oh, you're laughing. Okay. This is funny but you move to LA and you're playing the ha ha for nine people on a Tuesday, or you playing the you room for four people on a Thursday or whatever, you know, like you got to learn like how, how to improvise and how to like adapt. And you can't just go up there and regurgitate your act. Like you have to have a connection with them. And that's really what LA has taught me is how to connect with an audience, whether it's in Baghdad or Chicago or little rock or bakersfield it doesn't matter like just like like have a connection with people you know and and now i feel like having been here for a few years like 
I'm able to get on stage and kind of just feel the, the rhythm of the room and get the vibe and know exactly like what I can, what I can do to have the most success on stage. And, and that's really what I've learned the last few years being here and what I hope everyone learns, you know? Yeah. That's something that I'm slowly, I, I've been training myself to almost, I, not necessarily crowd work, but like, I guess riff up top just to, calibrate my brain to the energy of the room yeah yeah and i got sober too so i got sober three years ago and that was a huge change because for me it's like now i have self-awareness of what's going of everything that's going on in the room because i don't have a couple of cocktails to like you know kill the kill that edge or those nerves you know what i mean so now i'm like hyper aware of everything that's going on the the girl that's like staring at her phone or like you know the guy that's just like got his arms crossed like before when i had a couple drinks i'm like i didn't give a and i just got up there and did my act but now that i'm sober i like i have much more awareness of what's going on around me and again i can connect on a deeper level with the audience you know i i remember i was in vegas one time and i called this girl out i you know she was like they were like dressed up and they're in the front row I was like, oh, is this like your divorce weekend? And I nailed it. It was. She had gotten divorced. Yeah. And she's she, like, after the show, she's like, how did you know? And I'm like, I, it's just the vibe you gave off. You're just like, <laughs> divorce. Yeah, you're, on, you're in the front row dressed to the nines, you know, and I can tell like, I, I could just tell like you haven't been to Vegas a lot, you know, because because it was like wearing a dress to the Oscars. And I was like, you just look like you've been through some shit. <laughs> you know but you just get at, after a while after doing that you can you just kind of you just kind of feel what's going on around you you know and you get a sense of you know you get a sense because because audiences come together as one cohesive group you know what i mean that's why a lot of like best comedy clubs are all packed in together because because people stick in together and so you, you know now i'm at a point where i can just move an audience to where i want them to be and sometimes I'll dig myself a hole just to see if I can get out. But like, but that's the fun of stand up is to like see what can I do with this audience and where can I bring them, you know, metaphysically. Yeah, that that's an exercise that uh, me and Ben Hurwitz and once me and Saul Trujillo, we were talking about that. Like they both like to dig themselves into a hole up top to see, uh, to basically test if they could get themselves out of the situation they're in. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a cool feeling. Like, you know, again, like I, I was very blessed when I started stand up in Chicago that to like play big crowds, but like when I walk into a noisy bar and the three comedians before me, no one's paying attention to. And by the time I get off stage, everyone is looking at the stage and off their phone and quiet and the bartenders. You know what I mean? Like, I love that. Shit. Like I love being able to walk into a noisy bar, you know, and take over a room and get everyone to pay attention to the show because like that's the real challenge and oh, like yeah. you know again I, i'm really for, i'm really grateful for any job that i get but like you know you do 500 people at the irvine improv like yeah you're gonna do well because people are there to have a good time but you go do a <laughs> rugby bar on the south side of chicago with nine guys that are covered in dirt and blood and they're like all right make us laugh you people <laughs> like, <"Dude, laughs> okay <laughs> I'm still never gonna forget this. It was uh, I was I went to an uh, mic. It was maybe five years ago, uh, about a year into li- living here, and uh, dead room. Preacher Lawson then gets up. He just moved to L.A. and he just brought this energy, and everybody's exploding like this is like a packed comedy club. Yeah, and I'm watching this, and I'm like, how the f- am i supposed to follow this <laughs> right yeah and you just ride that wave yeah. you do your best to just yeah. and and that's that's the other cool thing about la and new york and and i'm not putting down any other comedy scene especially like chicago is like an amazing comedy scene austin seattle yeah. like just awesome comedy scenes but like the fact that like i have to follow bill burr you know the fact that i have to follow with tom segura the fact that like, you know what I mean? Like I, I need to know whether or not I can do that. Yeah. Like, that, because that's, that's, important. that's important to be able to go. I can, I can hold my own with the best of the best. You know what I mean? Because that's, 
truly what a professional comedian can do is just, you know, know that you had that, like, and that anxiety and fear of like, oh man, I gotta, like following preacher is not awesome or not, not, not <laughs> easy, excuse <laughs> yeah. me, because he is not so awesome. awesome, you know, but it's not easy, but like, you have to be like, look, everything that I've worked for and everything that I, all the time I put in has led me to this moment. And I have to, I have to embrace this moment and do my best. And, yeah. And how often, uh, particularly nowadays, how often do we have the chance to follow someone to the <laughs> level of preacher? Yeah. I did the, the show I did the other night in the OC Taylor Tomlinson was going after me. She's a beast, you know? Yeah. And, and so like, I wanted to like, I want to make her work and it's nothing personal, but like, I want, I want to show that like, I can be just as funny as the headliner. I, and I want to make them make me be the headliner. Like, that's how good I want to be that they're like, Oh, shit. like, well, obviously we have to headline the guy because he just can't feature anymore. You know? And that's, that's what everyone should aspire to be is to, if you're an MC, you should be trying to like make that, the feature work their ass off. And if you're the feature, you should try to be making the headliner work their ass off. And if you're the headliner, you should try to be like stay there, you know, trying to yeah. stay there because you never know when the next pandemic will hit. <laughs> oh yeah, that that is something I'm not taking for granted. I'm not ever taking for granted ever again because yeah. things could go sideways like this very quick. Yeah, Mar March 11th will be a day that uh, <laughs> that uh, that a, a comics 9/11. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, 3/11. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah, chilly, groovy. Yeah, this is uh this is a good conversation. Before before we uh, end things, I'm I'm actually just I'm curious. Uh, wh which deep dish place in Chicago? Yeah, have you done Pequods? I I've done Pequods. Pequods is great. I'm a Giordano's guy. I know it's kind of uh, uh, expansive now, but uh, they have they have a crust and a sauce that i i like i, I i'm not a big fan of luminati's it's fine if yeah, there, not, I'll eat yeah it. I've, I've, i went uh, once pizzeria uno i think is overrated uh but for me giordano's it also because of my childhood we we actually used to go to the original giordano's down on 63rd street as a family and i would have to sit next to my dad because every single time i would choke on the cheese and so he would take his fingers and stick them down my throat and pull the cheese out of my throat before i died every yeah. single time but yeah giordano's all the way I, I remember uh, I was uh, I was on tour with a band like uh, doing merch like I wasn't playing in the band but they were just friends of mine and we we're middle of the summer we went to Chicago and it was snowing surprise no. <laughs> and uh, we uh, that night we went to Pequods and it was a combination of the weather and just this salty buttery oh god I'm yeah <laughs> I haven't stopped thinking about it since. Yeah, dude, it's, it's so good. Yeah, no, this is. I, I can't thank you enough for doing this, man. This. Yeah. Uh, yeah is there anything you'd like to plug? Oh no! If you get, you know, uh, if you want to follow me on social media, um, Ken Gar was taken. K E N G A R R was taken. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter and on Instagram. Uh, check out my website for shows that are coming up right now. I don't have anything coming up like most comedians, <laughs> yeah. uh, but KenGar.com. I update my shows on there and you can also check out my standup on uh, Sirius XM. Just type in Ken Gar and a whole bunch of my stuff will come in. I, I actually on Spotify, uh, Sirius XM is random, but yeah, you could, you could download my first album on, um, Sirius XM, uh, called, uh, sitting in jail. So I, I didn't know you had an album. I got, a. I gotta yeah. give that a listen. Check it out, man. I appreciate yeah, I, it. I wish I did more research going into this. That's all right. I like the the natural organic conversation that we had. <laughs> Except Jews, right? Except the Jews. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're the worst. Rate and subscribe.